the way that I found you or that, that you, you got on my radar was that you're on this Netflix docu-series called Unnatural mm. Selection about DIY gene editing, which is what we're going to get into. But you, you're you on that series. So you get to – anybody who wants to watch it, it's freaking fascinating. And you get to see your dogs and see your dogs interacting with your kids and watch when you're working with them. There's some there's some scenes where you're working with them and you're snapping a whip and you're, and you're doing this dis- – I'm assuming distraction training – and yeah, yeah. Work, working with them, and it's they're they're an intimidating. Anybody who doesn't know what these dogs look like, do, go check it out or just Google them. They're they're badass looking dogs. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and you know, I think um, you know, I, I always like when I look at like the forms that I follow. I always look at nature as the inspiration, right? So like, evolution has been driving these the selection criteria, and admittedly. Like a guard dog is not in, is not selected for exactly the same job as like a wolf, right? Uh, because like wolves are pursuit predators. So I'm not making a pursuit predator, but like a big cat is an ambush predator. They do a lot more fighting their prey. And so a little bit of the cat, but you can't ignore the fact that it's built on the frame of a dog. So a little bit of the dog. So something between like a wolf and a black panther, put those together. That's sort of the basic frame that I'm trying to build on. Yeah. And you're doing this. I want you to explain how you went from being a guy who understood how to breed beagles to hunt rabbits, hunt cottontails, to being somebody who said, okay, I can look at these neos or I can look at mastiffs and I can make the dog I want through selective breeding. Where do you make the jump to exploring DIY (laughs) gene editing? How the hell does that happen? So that happened. uh, I was watching a TED talk. Um, I was at work, you know, I'd been doing this for years. Um, and, uh, and I made a lot of progress and I've put a lot of generations down and it's crossbreeding, right? So I'm not just breeding neos. So I'm, I'm crossbreeding them with various breeds. So it's like, I'm looking at the whole dog population as a, as a single entity, you know, forget breed lines. Dogs have a set of traits. I need to pick the traits that I want, combine them and create the output that I want. And so, um, You know, I was watching this TED talk and they were talking about uh, really they were talking about de novo synthesis or so like made from new um, uh, DNA. So like there are machines that can just print synthetic DNA. So you put in a sequence in a computer, feed it into this machine and the machine will create a completely artificial DNA molecule in the sequence that you defined on the computer. So you're, uh, what you're limited to, like you're not even limited to DNA you can get your hands on. So like if you want DNA from an extinct species, you can get that DNA. And they were talking about how easy it is to make it. Because in my mind at the time, I kind of imagined if you want genes in your population, you have to be able to breed them. And I knew about like genetic engineering, everybody kind of does, but I knew exactly what everybody knows. It's like something they do in multi-million dollar labs. And so, and like, you know, I had no idea what was involved, but they were talking about the process of synthetic biology. So you can create a completely synthetic and it's, it's real DNA. It's just generated, not in a cell. And so you create that and you can put that in any organism. And if it's programmed correctly, like if the sequence is made in the right way, it will do the thing that you encoded into the DNA. So you can take a gene from a jellyfish and put it in a bacteria and the bacteria will do whatever the jellyfish gene tells it to do. And so you, and you can print it off. So you can just go online, send a sequence to a company. They'll print it off and send it back to you in a tube, DNA in a little tube, you know, it'll be like a tube like this size. And then you'll, you'll receive that. And then you can just, as long as you can get that DNA in your organism, then you can program whatever you want on a computer and then put it in your real living creature. And that's where we are in biology right now. And so that just sort of blew my mind. And I was like, okay, I have to find a way to do this with dogs because this is the tool I've been looking for. If I can precisely add anything, then I can add things. I'm not limited to the dog gene pool anymore. It's like all of genetics becomes your toolkit. What traits do you want your dogs to have? 
Yeah, and this you you've kind of leapt right into the designer dog argument or the the, the fear, I should say, right? Is yeah. what you're saying is anybody can theoretically get access to this and put whatever they want in. And that's where people, well, people get scared for two reasons, right? They get scared because they don't understand it. And they get scared sure. because the wrong person doing this could create something that's <laughs> pretty nasty, right? But sure. what you were looking at is going, this this TED Talk opened your eyes to the fact that this was actually a possibility for you to take your dog breeding program. And instead of just doing the long game approach that we've we've been doing for 30,000 years, you said, I have this, yeah. new, this new technology that I can, I can just sort of speed up this process and get the traits I want through this. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, once I started looking into all of that, I learned about things like CRISPR, you know, CRISPR is sort of the, the fancy new toy everybody talks about, and it's a gene editing technology. So what I was learning about at first was just the ability to take a gene and make it artificially and cheaply. Um, it's like 20 cents a base pair. So like per letter of DNA, like 20 cents. And so you get that into your organism and then you create your whatever organism. But the, the subtler point, like it, it's, it's not necessarily easy to distinguish putting a gene, like a trans gene into an organism, but also CRISPR allows you to go into the living genome and subtract things, add things, change things that are already there. So you can take like, uh, like you could take the short tail gene, like the mutation that causes short tails in um, a bobtail breed, and you could put that in Rottweilers, and they would be born bobtail with no other with no other genes from any other breed in them. And so you could have a naturally bobtail Rottweiler with no other crossbred traits. Yeah, and, and so correct me if I'm wrong here, but kind of what you're describing is that we've had genetic modification for a long time. So 1973 was the first time they started doing this on bacteria and stuff. And now this CRISPR technology is probably like what you would technically call gene editing, right? Where you're clipping yep. out a sequence and putting a new one in there. Is that is that right? And we and we could do that, right? But it was just harder, and it was harder to target. So like CRISPR, uh, like I think today or yesterday they they announced that the people, or at least two of the three people that discovered CRISPR and its applications and what it can do, just won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Yep. Um, so. CRISPR is um, uh, it allows you to do things like we had the other things like zinc finger nuclease and uh, talons, which could also do gene editing, but they're way harder to use. This is super easy to use, super cheap to use. So like somebody like me in a shed can use CRISPR to do genome editing for a few hundred dollars instead of a much, much bigger, much, much harder task of trying to do genome editing. So that's what makes it different. It's not that it gives us a new ability. It gives us a dramatic decrease in the difficulty and price to do it. Yeah. And there, there is that, that reality is what we fight with, I think, right. As it, like the general population looks at them and they go, they, this should be done in a Pfizer type of lab, right? Like we yeah. feel that. And I, was, I was thinking about this when I knew we were going to do this interview where you know, there's a big concern with the Amazon rainforest and the deforestation and, and burning, you know, what we're losing for medicinal plants. Cause it's like 80% yeah. of our, our uh, pharmaceuticals come from plants. And so I was thinking about this. I was like, you know, we think these, you know, Glaxo, GlaxoSmithKline or whatever is in the lab synthesizing this stuff, but it's coming from plants. It's very yeah. simple. And there's, you know, like native cultures that are aware of this, we're losing that. And so I think we have this sort of, I don't know if it's a cognitive bias or what, but we, we think about this as being such a wildly uh, scientific out of reach process that I don't like yeah. when I, before this, I would have said, David, you, you shouldn't be doing this. Like before I saw the, <laughs> before I saw the documentary and before I started researching this, I would have said, no way should some dude in his, in his shed in Mississippi be doing this, but right. it's really not as wild as, as it sounds. Exactly. Exactly. And honestly, it's the same thing dog breeders have been doing. It's just a way faster way to do it. Yep. So like, you know, there's nothing natural about, you know, a uh, uh, wired hair, you know, like the wire hair trait that's in so many breeds of dog. 
Wolves don't have that trait, you know, or like curly hair that you see in, in a lot of, a lot of breeds. Wolves don't have that trait. That was a mutation that we took advantage of, but now you can create those mutations and do the same thing. So whether we wait around for a mutation to happen or cause it on purpose or transfer a trait from one species to another, like for example, um, and there's some things that we just will never be able to reasonably select for. And that's one of the things that really drew me to this technology is like, what do you do? Like, how do you create, if your breed is 100% affected by a genetic disease, and dogs have a huge number of genetic diseases, like really ridiculous number. If your breed has like 90%, 90 plus percent instance, how do you select away from that without destroying genetic diversity? You can't do it in a single generation. You have to do it in a lot of generations and very slowly eliminate it because otherwise, if you just say, we'll only breed this tiny fraction and the rest of them will just be out of the gene pool, you're destroying what genetic diversity you have. And for the most part, lack of genetic diversity is the root of the problem. Dalmatians are a really good example. That's the one I always use with, with hyperuricemia. But also, like, pugs, I think, uh, have like a 80 plus, 90 plus percent uh, instance of hip dysplasia. Um, you know, English bulldogs right behind them. And if you're going to try and breed that out, especially if it's a trait that has multiple genes, how do you eliminate all of that? It would take hundreds of years yeah. and things that affect all the big breeds like short lives, like wolves, the same size don't live short lives. So there's something wrong with our mastiffs. And how do you select for that? You breed, you, you could like save eggs and sperm. And then wait for your dogs to grow old and die. And then use those eggs and sperm in like in vitro fertilization. And then create another litter. And then wait for them to grow old and die after collecting. And then wait for the select for the oldest. But that means each generation is like 10, 15 years. And if you're successful, you're doing like 16, 17 year generations. It's going to take you several hundred years to pull that off. But in mice, in the lab, they've genetically modified them to live three times longer. Yep. Yeah, it will. And what you're, again, what you're saying is we've, we've been doing this. We're just not good at it. Like we're, we, exactly. like we, we can get certain traits that we like, and yeah. a lot of it is aesthetics. And we talk about that a lot on here. People choose dogs because of what they look like and not yeah, what's yeah. under the hood. And it's a big issue. We, we talk about it, the bloodlines and the pedigrees and all this stuff all the time and how, how many myths and misconceptions are out there. And it's an easy thing easier to breed for looks and color. Oh yeah, of course. Than, and it's easy to choose a dog based on those. But when you start getting yeah. into what you really want, and you said this earlier perfectly was, you know, uh, intellect, intelligence, or athleticism, you know, you want to get rid of the genetic disorders, all of those things, that's a, that's a, like a pretty complex little stew there. And you're saying really we're just, we're just jumping the line now. And this technology is going to allow us to get in there and get rid of some of this stuff without the time it would take. And honestly, there's probably not a ton of effort in the general dog breeding population to get rid of this stuff anyway. I mean, we see that all the time. Yeah. And, that, and that's a bad thing because like, you know, especially when you're looking at things like, um, you know, like the way the way a lot of working breeds go when they become show dogs, you know, they just get exaggerated and exaggerated until they're completely non-functional. And so you lose so much of that. And, you know, I think if you were trying to restore, and that's why every now and then you have to see these like restoration programs, somebody will want to like fix the English bulldog. And so they'll be breeding them with pit bulls or whatever and try and like make a, a better English bulldog more like the original. And there's a lot of them working on trying to recreate the original working masters. And so you get this thing where people like try to bring it back to where it came from, but it almost always involves either a whole lot of selection or a good bit of crossbreeding. And, you know, if you can identify what traits have, have sort of walked off the cliff here, uh, you can just edit them back uh, without necessarily having to do that. Um, and at the same time, you know, like I said, there's some things you just can't select for. Uh, and there's some things that uh, will hide. So even the best selection can't save you, or even the best like non-genetic technology selection can't save you from recessive genes. I mean, it will eventually, but recessive traits can hide for generations and generations. And you can just keep breeding best to best and still produce dogs that have genetic diseases over time. And it takes a long time. It will eventually get rid of it. 
But uh, if you even if you just do like genome sequencing, you know, you take your breeding pair, you sequence them. You not only know what traits they display, you also know what they carry for. And if they both carry for a genetic disease, you know, it's a bad idea to breed them yep. or at least, you know what to expect. And there's also the opportunity if you had two extraordinary individuals and they both carried for a genetic disease, but they didn't have it and you wanted to breed them together, you might be able to edit the embryos so that they don't have that genetic disease. So you could still get that combination without the negative uh, cost. Yeah, it's it's a wild concept. To, it's 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 wild to take in, but it's also. I was thinking about this when I when I started watching that show. I wanted to not like you because I was like, <laughs> just initially I was like, this guy's freaking nuts. I hear that a lot. <laughs> this sucks. Like, there's no way this can be a good idea. But when you start being exposed to this, you go, this is coming. Like this is it, it's already here. It, it's it's coming, and it's always it's very easy to sort of default to the negative. Like people are going to use this wrong, yeah. but not to go, man. The the potential positives of this are incredible, yeah. and it's not only with our dogs. Like this is you, like people listening to this, your your kids and grandkids. They're you're going to have dogs <laughs> that are vastly different than the ones we're dealing with. That are probably yeah. going to be way healthier because of this. That's probably what, and then maybe there'll be some unintended stuff along the way. Like we, we can't see the future, but yeah. it's very likely. And what, what seems to be the case that's going on with dogs and genetic engineering is they're sort of the Trojan horse for this process and proof of concept for human genetic disorders. And you're yeah. seeing that with like muscular dystrophy. They've done some little studies and it seems very correlated to what's going to be possible with humans. And it's really promising. 